Hello, everybody, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. And if you're tuning into this, what means you clicked either the YouTube link or you clicked the Spotify link or wherever you get your podcast. And you know exactly the reason that we are gathered here today for this bonus episode. Horwat and I wearing our whites because the Pittsburgh Penguins have cleaned house. So we're going clean sheet here on the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. We have a few guests joining us in a couple minutes to give their thoughts on Ron Hextall, Brian Burke, and Chris Pryor all being relieved of their duties. We have Doug Gladkey of Four Checking TV, as well as Hunter Hodes of Locked On Penguins joining us here in just a few moments. But that is the big news of the day. Last night, Penguin season ends. They missed the playoffs for the first time since 2006. And now, President of Hockey Ops, Brian Burke, General Manager Ron Hextall, and AGM Chris Pryor all relieved of their duties. Horwat, the writing was on the wall with this one, wasn't it? Oh, it was. Oh, it was. You'd have to assume everywhere from around the <clears throat> around the uh, trade deadline to to the downfall of the season. Hell, the writing may have been on the wall over the offseason. Re-signing Kesberry Kapanen, um, sticking around with Brock McGinn, and even if you want to take it back before that, the Jeff Carter extension that's still going to eat away at us. Um, it wasn't good. It was a disaster of a tenure. It's it was short and unsweet. Let's say that. And no one really ever figured out what Brian Burke did in the organization. And now with Chris Pryor out as well. Well, 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 did we find out who was behind the Mikhail Granlund debacle? Mm -hmm. So there's gonna be a lot to unpack over the next couple of days, weeks, months, up until uh, someone's hired. That could happen quickly too, but we'll see. It took two weeks between general manager Jim Rutherford leaving the Pittsburgh Penguins organization and the hiring of Burke and Hextall back in 2021. I would expect it's a bit longer of a process. It's probably something that's yeah. going to take place throughout the entirety of the playoffs, because as I'm sure one of our guests or even you will mention, one of the candidates that they like is still the general manager of a team currently heading to the Stanley Cup playoffs. But Hextall and Burke were hired as a duo back in February of 2021. And since then, a 118, 70, and 24 regular season record, a 5 and 9 record in the playoffs, 0 and 2 in playoff series, and one pretty meaningless division title in 2020 21 as they won the East Division during the COVID year. But it was also announced by the Penguins that head coach Mike Sullivan will be assisting during the transition, not in the GM search, as Rob Rossi of The Athletic clarifies, just in other small tasks to close out the 2022 23 season. So, the GM search has officially begun in Pittsburgh, and let's welcome on Hunter Hodes of Locked On Penguins to get his thoughts on today's news. Hunter, welcome to the show. We appreciate you joining us and giving us a few moments. Like you, we all mentioned already, not a surprise that Hextall and Burke are out after the season. What do you think was the nail in the coffin for this duo? Oh, wow. Nail in the coffin. Oh, that's a that's a great question, to be honest, because you could argue any number of things, to be honest. But I think, you know, the final nail in the coffin was <clears throat> them missing, this team missing the playoffs. You know, I don't think the organization, no matter who the ownership is, takes this lightly. Uh, I don't think it was one just specific move. You could argue it was any number of moves that this general manager has made during his tenure that could be the nail in the coffin. But if you're asking me, it's them missing the playoffs. You know, 16 straight years. Fenway Sports Group, you know, we, everyone's been asking, you know, how much do they pay attention? How much do they pay attention? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that they have been at least paying a little bit of attention because they waited um, <clears throat> less than, what, 20, 15 hours after their final game of the season to cut bait with everyone. Um, I, I think that was the fight. This is the final nail in the coffin, if you're asking me. You know, I think they had the mandate to at least make the playoffs. If they lost in round one in maybe a tough fight, I think maybe they could have come back. Mm. I personally wouldn't have. I would have just cut bait with them even with a round one loss. But it was always going to take a lot for them to come back next season. And I think it was them missing the playoffs, especially that losing that Chicago game. That one, I think, really sealed their fate. Yeah, you could say that was it. I mean, apparently, according to, I believe it was Rossi. I'm trying to find the stuff now. Um, pretty much... Hextall and Burke said their goodbyes to the organization a couple days ago. Uh, Chris uh, Pryor effectively stopped showing up. That may have been Yoey saying all this, too. One of those two, I'm pretty sure. I saw Rossi said it today. I think it was Chris Pryor that stopped showing up. And then I think Yoey, yeah, Yoey, yeah, Yoey said it was Chris Pryor that orchestrated the Grandland trade. Yeah, yeah. And so, 
pretty much it seemed like they knew this was coming for a while now. Um, and there's quite a lot that can happen. And when it comes to FSG paying attention or not, uh, apparently they haven't. I mean, they've obviously there was the firing for uh, Hextall, Pryor, and Burke, but also they have had people um, dealing with hockey operations stuff uh, ever since uh, they were purchased. Uh, because you know, Rossi tweeted also FSG has been involved all season. It hired multiple new heads of department on the business since on the business side, I believe. Um, and David Beeston, the alternate governor or something like that, I believe is the guy we're getting in the press conference later today. I think Rossi's, I think they've been saying he's the guy that's been around the team most of the season. Yes. I think he's been reporting back to John Henry and Tom Warner, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And that's the guy we're getting, uh, at that presser later today so they've been around they've been keeping an eye on things and it you but you also don't need to be a rocket scientist to see 16 straight postseason appearances oh hey also your two best players played all eight all 82 games and you still miss what went wrong there you have it no yeah i mean you're 100 right um you know and they they even said the press release they still want to compete they're, they even said they're not rebuilding this is not a retool we're we're going we're gunning for it next year and in future years. So whoever they bring in, uh, whether it's, you know, I saw you guys teased off the top, that GM candidate that is on a playoff team right now, which I'm sure you guys will get to pretty soon. There's a lot of smoke surrounding him or it's someone else. They want someone to come in here, you know, maybe fix some of the mistakes that Hextall made and also just make this team better so that the core has the best chance to win next year and going forward. Yeah. And of course that mystery general manager, everybody knows because it's all over Twitter is Kyle Dubas of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Hunter, you're somebody that I've talked to and, and we've talked about the realistic opportunity for Dubas to become the Penguins general manager. How much do you think that that is going to weigh on this search? Do you think that obviously there's going to be several candidates and several that we've talked about personally, but Dubas seems to be the headliner that at least the fan base has sort of gravitated towards. Do you think there's a realistic chance that Dubas will leave the Toronto Maple Leafs for the Pittsburgh Penguins, especially if the Leafs are able to go on somewhat of a run here? Yeah, I mean, it, it's tough because, you know, I think the Leafs, they would have the money to keep him. I mean, they obviously are one of the, the richest organizations in the league. Um, his contract is up, though, so I think he's maybe going to look to see if there's any opportunities. I think the biggest key, I think, is what you said, Nick. How far do they go? Do they lose in round one again for the memes? Do they beat Tampa Bay and beat Boston maybe? That's going to be a tall order if Boston gets through four, which I think they will. I think it's really all going to come down to that. But, you know, we started hearing, you know, the Dubas smoke yesterday. I think it was actually Mark Madden that originally tweeted it. I didn't see the tweet. I got a text from someone who's closer to the team said that, you know, just watch out for that. And that's carried over into today. Um, he makes a lot of sense. He's a forward thinker. He uses analytics. His eye test is usually pretty good. He does succumb to some of those weird veteran signings that we've seen in Toronto. Like, you know, I don't really think Wayne Simmons is any good anymore. And um, a couple other players that he signed and traded for as well. But, you know, compared to Ron Hextall, you know, it's, it's up here. Um, Dubas's, but, Dubas's trap is the Sioux Greyhounds. Yes. Which is where Wayne Simmons came from. I hate to break it to everybody. That's where Jeff Carter came from as well. But... Um, I think Dubas at least also understands what it means to keep a core together. And I think that's a driving force in that as well. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, Fenway, you know, everything, I, I think Elliot Freeman was the one I mentioned yesterday. They want to build out the Penguins analytics staff. Dubas is very big in analytics. I'm sure he could bring some people over to this organization, either from the Leafs or from other organizations, if he gets the job. Um, I'm just, I'm not surprised that there's a lot of smoke surrounding him because I do think he's a good general manager and Fenway, they usually like to swing for some of the best of the best. They, they like having very good people in place to run their teams. And this is really going to be their first instance here with the Penguins where they can choose who they want. They can go through a very diligent process and we'll, we'll see who they pick. But I think it's going to be someone again, who's a forward thinker, uses analytics, um, someone definitely a bit seasoned. Um, for this role. And yeah, I mean, I'm really curious to see what they do. You know, another one of my top calls would be Eric Tolsky from Carolina. I think he's done a tremendous job for the Hurricanes down there. You know, people have said Sam Ventura from Buffalo. He was obviously here. That makes a lot of sense. I threw Mike Gillis out this morning. I think he had that very long plan for the last, um, I think he had an interview a couple of years ago. He wrote that, that very long plan on paper. I don't know if you guys, you guys might remember that. 
Um, his tenure didn't go well in Vancouver. I don't obviously towards the end, but mm-hmm. you know, I'd be intrigued about him for sure too. Those are just a few names off the top of my head. All righty. Well, Hunter, thank you so much for giving us a couple minutes today. We appreciate you coming on and we're definitely going to have you back in the future because there's plenty to unpack about the Pittsburgh Penguins of the 2022-23 season as we head into the summer. So thank you again, Hunter, for joining us. Yes, thank you. And you guys are both going to be coming on my show very soon. Don't worry. Looking forward to it, man. So that was Hunter Hodes of the Locked on Penguins podcast, bringing up a couple very interesting names there. I know Sam Ventura is one that I had circled. Mm -hmm. Another name from Buffalo that I have circled, former Pittsburgh Penguins front office member Jason Carmanos is currently the AGM in Buffalo. So we'll see what happens with that. But definitely a lot of decisions to make for the Pittsburgh Penguins and whoever gets hired in that position. And with that, we bring on Doug Gladkey of Four Checking TV to get his thoughts on today's news as well. Dougie, how you doing today? I'm doing good, guys. How you doing? Doing great. It's obviously an interesting day. Mixed emotions for, for those who follow the Pittsburgh Penguins as they miss the playoffs for the first time since 2006. But there is a direction and there is change that is happening, which is always an exciting time around any professional sports team. So with that in mind, Dougie, obviously the news today that Ron Hextall, Chris Pryor, Brian Burke, all out of the door. Who do you see, as we obviously just ta- heard from Hunter, do you concur with what he said about some of the, the candidates? And do you have any other names that you've heard uh, that would make sense to you or that you think would make sense uh, for the next job of Pittsburgh Penguin general manager? I pretty much concur with what Hunter said. I mm-hmm. also like the point that you guys made about Jason Carmanos, potentially. Um, but my my biggest thing is I feel like it has to be either Kyle Dubas or Eric Tolsky. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and when you do make that hire, I think that you try to sell Sam Ventura on the idea of moving back home and offer him a title of director of hockey operations and analytics. Mm-hmm. You know, let him start like spearheading this analytics department that Fenway wants to build. Cause I, I don't really think that you can think of a better person in the sport right now, outside of potentially Eric Tolsky than San, San Ventura to be that guy. And that'd be, a, that'd be a huge pick too, especially considering um, the analytics direction that Fenway wants to take the team. Uh, I mean, everyone that we're discussing so far has their hand in the analytics department and they're growing it. Uh, in their respective positions, but I mean, Sam Ventura seems to be uh, of, I mean, I don't know much about Eric Tolsky. Everyone else does apparently (laughs) Uh, some research I'll have to do, but when it comes to Sam Ventura, he's a guy that got the um, analytics stuff kicked off in Pittsburgh, really, whenever he was here before that's pretty much where it all stemmed from. He went on to do things with the, with the Buffalo Uh, coming back home seems like a great option as well. If, uh, if, if there's a big swing and a miss on Kyle Dubas or whatever happens there. Yeah. You know, and my, my other main point with Sam is I really, really like what Sam does in terms of contract extensions, you know, like you could see it like in Buffalo, like the Thompson extension, Matias Samuelson, Dylan Cozens. Those are all contract extensions that whenever they were dropped, especially the Tage Thompson one, everybody's like, okay, this is kind of crazy. Right. But now Tage is a borderline 50 goal score. He finished with in the high 40s this year and looks like one of the better players in the league, you know. And I just I think um, you know, as much as I would like Sam like in a role in some capacity, obviously I think the main goal has to be to go for Dubis or Tolski. Um, obviously I feel like we've all heard about a lot of good things about Eric Tolsky throughout the league. Um, he's done a great job in Carolina. And although I think it would be difficult to pluck him from Carolina, I think if you sell him on the idea of becoming a GM and being able to run his own show, he might, he might come over. Yeah. I I think whoever ends up getting the position is obviously inheriting a tough spot because Mm -hmm. you have these. Hall of Fame talents that are at 35, 36 years old, but you also have a lot of bad contracts and a lot of not great contributors surrounding them right now. I mean, people will talk about Jeff Petrie. We already mentioned Jeff Carter once on this show. Mikhail Granlin has come up. So it's going to be a tough, tough spot. 
but I think the biggest issue is goaltending. What do you think whoever's hired is the biggest decision looming for them this off season? Honestly, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's going to be goaltending um, outside of, you know, finding what, what to do with this Mikhail Granlin contract that they just randomly decided to inherit this year. Um, it's going to be goaltending because my, my whole thing is, is if I had it my way, both Jari and DeSmith would not be back. Um, so therefore you have to find two goaltenders, but at the same time you have to free up enough money to probably run a true one, a one B tandem. Yeah. Unless you go get like a bona fide stud, but mm. let's be honest, they don't have the assets to go get like somebody huge on the trade market. Like if Thatcher Demko were to still be available or something. So they do have the benefit because of Hextall's, I'm going to call it arrogance for now. Ron Hextall's arrogance to not trade away that first round pick this year. It is a top 16 pick. So yes. if whoever comes in is willing to wheel and deal with that, um, you could fetch something. I don't know how big that something could be. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, the conversation around the first-round pick that we have is changed. It has adjusted because Hextall wasn't going to give it up. We know this. He said he wasn't right. going to. We thought maybe it was a misinterpretation. Well, he didn't, and we still have it. Now that he's gone, that pick is still there. That pick is free to be used however the new person likes it. So... I think that's a little interesting wrench tossed into the situation of finding not even just a goalie, but finding other replacement players is you now have that first round pick to kind of be used. Mm -hmm. I mean, it also it, I don't think I'd be totally angry if we used it for a draft in the draft and said, we're going to make a top half selection. I wouldn't hate that either. Um, it's a bit more of a looking down the line solution, but Hey, you know what? Whoever comes in has got a big decision to make. I think specifically with that pick, all of a sudden. Yeah, and I also, I, I'll also go this far. I don't think I would be upset if they used the first to move out a contract. That too. At this point in the game, um, because it's going to be very hard to move that Mikael Granlin contract. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, everybody can always say there's always going to be one sorry individual, but. Um, I just – I don't see it. Like, that might be one of the worst trades I've seen them make probably in our lifetime. Um, and, like, it just – it he – there was no impact whatsoever outside of a garbage time goal against the Flyers. Like, nothing. Yeah. And even without scoring, I mean, uh, what he provided at five-on-five, five, what he provided at the penalty kill w was negative to what – you were getting from a Brock McGinn, even from a Kasperi captain who was having a really bad season in Pittsburgh. He yeah. still provided more uh, than what Mikhail Granlin did. So I, I, I agree that that's going to be a tough contract to move. And if you can, you should. But uh, it is certainly not a position where this guy's going to come in and it's going to be all fruits and roses and he's not going to have to do too much. But I, I think the interesting thing about this general manager search is how different it's going to be than the one that netted Hextall and Burke in Pittsburgh, because that one happened based on, hey, Rutherford's gone. Our season started a week and a half ago. So you're mm -hmm. not getting the Dubis call. You're not getting the certain calls for guys that are already in positions for the season, because a lot of them right. are, hey, we are here. We're under contract. We're not really willing to leave and join that ship in the middle of its course. Now the Penguins have the benefit of taking their time looking at all the options, doing multiple rounds of interviews and sitting there and really casting a wide net, which is what they're going to need to do because this is essentially the last general manager of the Sidney Crosby era. You're hoping that it's the last one because if not, then you're, you're once again wasting time at the end yes. of one of the greatest players to ever play the game's career because this should be the guy that finishes the, the career of Crosby, Malkin, and Latang. So you need to make sure that this hire is correct because you cannot afford another misstep in the general manager's chair. Yeah, and as much, as unfortunate as it is to have the playoff streak end, it might actually end up being a blessing in disguise for them because they have two full months now until the NHL draft to find somebody and hire them. Yeah. You know, and one other quick point I'm going to make is 
it's going to be even more difficult for whoever the new GM is like, take the goaltending situation contracts aside, scouting, scouting and drafting. It's, it's going to be very hard for them to replenish that because let's be honest, like the drafting track record wasn't good. And if I stand corrected, like there were a lot of Hextall guys in that, in the hockey ops department that they will probably need to still clean out as they begin this transition process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's going to be a wild summer, both in the front office and on the ice with the players and the contracts that are considered. Uh, The first round pick is certainly something that's going to be talked about, but as of right now, the big news line and storyline is that Hextall and Burke are out. That is Doug Gladkey of four checking TV. Thank you so much for joining us, Doug. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. So that's the news right there. I, I I mean, Doug brought up some very good points as well where, yeah, you have to think about the fact that, yeah, the top three were gone, but how many guys in that organization are still Hextall and Burke? Guys, I know that they were only there for two years, but they had to put people that they trust in place, and some of those people might be out of a job sooner rather than later. It depends on when the new general manager is hired. Horwat, before we go, I want to talk timetable. When is the drop dead date that you would expect the new general manager to be named? Because I would think Doug mentioned the draft. I would think you would have to do it by the end of the Stanley Cup playoffs, but also maybe beforehand because of what he mentioned there with the hockey ops staff and scouting and being able to get in and strategize for the NHL draft. So I'm saying by the Eastern Conference Finals, we'll have the name of the next general manager, the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think that was about the same time that I was going to say because – Stanley Cup final is supposed to get handed out around July 14th or 15th. That's like the drop. That's like the final date. Am I reading that right? No, I'm not. June? Sorry. Yes. Okay. June. I was going to say had, July. Interesting. Sorry. Yeah, I definitely had the wrong month of my thing. Stanley Cup final is around June 8th-ish. So, hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, July 1st is free agency, obviously, in the draft a few days before then. So, I would say you're right, Eastern Conference Final before then, East, I guess, Conference Finals. Um, Any time before the Stanley Cup Final, re- genuinely, is probably the best uh, best bet on the date of yep. a new face. A couple yep. new faces, really. Um, gonna, pre- you know, gonna knock out a GM, probably an AGM, and perhaps a president of Hockey Ops, considering Brian Burke was the first one in franchise history. Yeah, that one's a little questionable. Or if it's just going to be GM slash president again, mm-hmm. uh, we will have to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, so, but giving someone the keys to the palace, it will. That's an that's an that's an attractive piece. Yep. Four to six weeks is is probably the timeline that we both just mentioned right there. It's going to be a very busy four to six weeks for Fenway Sports Group trying to find the leaders for the Pittsburgh Penguins, and of course. I think that'll depend if it is a split position still on who ends up getting the general manager position. If it's somebody like Sam Ventura that hasn't held a GM position before that I don't see him getting the entire keys to the kingdom. But if it's a guy like uh, Kyle Dubas could certainly see that happening because he has the experience of the general manager position and will be able to learn on the fly with the president of hockey ops position as he already understands uh, the position beforehand. That's just my take on it and that is also the take of doug gladkey of four checking tv hunter hodes of locked on penguins nick horwatt of inside the penguins and of course me as well inside the penguins tip of the iceberg penguins to go that is the the breaking news hextall is gone most of pittsburgh is rejoicing there's still a lot of work to be done but that's going to do it for this special bonus episode of the tip of the iceberg we'll see you guys next time